Chapter 9 Koval strode into the control center of the warbird, Fry Kala, his thoughts dark. Speculations about the Empire's future, had weighed heavily upon his mind of late. Despite the best efforts of the Tal Shiar's vice chairman, Senator Vrenak, to negotiate a non-aggression pact with the sprawling Dominion, Koval found it difficult to believe that those shape-shifting Gamma Quadrant Devils, and their unctuous Vorta middlemen, would honor any such agreement, for long. For months now, a sense of urgency had been steadily growing within the Tal Shiar leader's gut, an almost desperate need to prove that the best days of the Praetor's venerable congeries of worlds had not already passed. Of course, there were things to be thankful for, to be sure. Nine years previously, Terrid Nine, a world just on the Federation side of the Stelae Lur loan, the outmarches, which the Federation called the Romulan Neutral Zone, had suffered a devastating attack by the rapacious Borg Collective. Koval often wondered what would have happened had the conquest-driven cyborgs continued across the neutral zone toward the core of the Empire. Could Romulus itself have survived such an onslaught? Would he have been forced to seek a long-term alliance with the Federation, whose continual, omnidirectional expansion, many in the Empire regarded as a threat, in and of itself? If the Dominion behaves as treacherously as seems likely, Koval thought glumly, then I may yet be forced to take just such an action. Fortunately, some of the reassurance Koval sought, was now displayed upon the Thry Kala's central viewscreen. He looked upon a vast assemblage of spaceborne constructs, a colossal loop of machinery, energy collectors, and habitat modules that dwarfed even the largest warbirds of the Praetor's armadas. And in the ring center, lay a concentration of unimaginably potent forces, a discovery that promised to revivify the Empire, and perhaps, one day, even to extend its reach to every quadrant of the galaxy. Taking a seat in the command chair, Koval silently watched the coruscating energies in the screen center for the better part of an hour, while junior officers busied themselves monitoring the banks of equipment. It was their responsibility to assist the energy station's technical crews in locating and dampening out all local subspace instabilities before irreparable harm could befall either the energy extraction equipment or the power source's delicately balanced containment apparatus. Koval was unpleasantly aware that the crew had failed to mask all evidence of the phenomenon's presence, the recent unwelcome intrusion of the First Federation starship into the cloaked zone had amply demonstrated those failures. In the aftermath, an overzealous warbird captain had overstepped his authority by destroying that Federation vessel, forcing Koval to have him summarily executed. Now that the incident had attracted the attention of the Federation's flagship, Koval would countenance no further errors or unforeseen complications. A hatchway opened, and a distraught young Decurion entered the control center, practically at a run. Chairman Koval, he said breathlessly, We've just received a stealth signal from the Kairosan orbital comm tether. There has been an incident on the planet. Koval sighed. Why were so many junior officers averse to speaking plainly these days? Specificity and brevity are among the cardinal virtues, to call. Let me have both. The younger man paused for a moment, composing his thoughts before continuing. Somehow, the Starfleet detainees have escaped from the base on Kiaros 4. They've taken one of our small scout vessels off-planet. Koval suppressed any outward show of surprise or anger, but he felt them both nonetheless. He quickly reassured himself, even though the Federation now surely knows of the covert Romulan presence on Kiaros 4, they still have virtually no chance of correctly assessing the Empire's larger agenda. By the time they do that, it will be far, far too late. What is the status of our people there, Koval said evenly. The Starfleet prisoners evidently overpowered three of our technicians, chairman, and forced them off the scout ship before using it to make their escape. The technicians were fortunate not to have been taken hostage. Koval shook his head. Not at all. There probably wasn't enough room on the scout ship to take anyone else aboard. What is the status of the rest of our personnel on the base? There were no casualties, Chairman. Fortunate. Even with a memory scanner, I cannot debrief the dead. The rebel base is compromised, Decurion. Evacuated at once. 
Instruct all personnel to withdraw to the secondary compound. Yes, Chairman. As soon as the evacuation is complete, you will purge the facility. It will be done, sir. The Decurion saluted, touching his clenched fist to his chest. He turned swiftly and was gone. Koval smiled to himself. Any scan of the base's remains would reveal the blast signatures of Starfleet quantum torpedoes, armaments that the Tal Shiar had acquired through third parties and then hidden beneath the Army of Light complex during its construction long ago. Thus, the Kairosan electorate would have even further proof of Federation perfidy before voting on the question of Federation membership, just two short days from now. By that time, Koval expected to have concluded his business with Commander Zweller as well. Zweller had aided the Kairosan rebels to sway the election in favor of Romulus, just as he had promised to do. And despite Zweller's subsequent falling out with Grelin, a deal was still a deal. Spies had to be especially circumspect about honoring their under-the-table agreements. Or at least they had to appear to be. To do any less was simply bad business, and could invite unpredictable responses from one's adversaries. Now that Sweller had escaped from the rebels, Koval fully expected to give the commander his just due, a list of Romulan agents working on Federation worlds. A list of probably compromised intelligence officers who would shortly find themselves purged, their families vanished, their lands and properties confiscated. Section 31 would almost certainly execute the spy purge themselves, thereby saving Koval and his bureau a great deal of trouble and expense. Quietly lauding himself for his own cleverness, Koval allowed his lips to torque into an, almost, perceptible smile. But there would be plenty of time to consider such things after the Kairosan referendum. In the meantime, much remained to be accomplished. Koval rose from his seat and approached Subcenturian Vari, the young woman who was monitoring the helm console. Though her collar did not bear the bureau's insignia, she was, nevertheless, one of his most prized Tal Shiar staff officers, one of the many sets of clandestine eyes and ears he had positioned throughout the Praetor's fleet. She was someone to whom he could entrust a great deal of privileged information. Most important, she refrained from prying into anything he chose deliberately not to tell her. The subcenturion snapped to attention. Sir. I must inspect the main energy facility, and witness the next series of full power tests, he said, nodding toward the image on the screen. Send the technicians who came into contact with the Starfleet escapees, to meet me there for their debriefings. It will be done, Mr. Chairman, she said crisply. I will return to the Thry Kala within two days, he said, and then left the control center. Two days, he thought. At which time, I will have a very important appointment to keep. End of chapter. Editor's note. In the event that this book has been posted at another location, please note that this audiobook was created by YouTube channel, YJK Audiobooks. Please visit our YouTube channel for other exciting stories. Also, if you are enjoying this audiobook, please consider supporting the expense of our projects through our Patreon page. Those who do so have access to exclusive book series, are able to download the MP3 files for all books we create, and also have early access to our normal YouTube releases. For more details please visit, Patreon dot com slash yjk audiobooks the link is also available in the video description below thank you for listening and now back to the story chapter 10 as soon as the romulan scout ship touched down in the enterprise's shuttle bay crusher had the still slumbering ghrelin and the surviving slayton crew members including Corey Zweller, beamed directly to sickbay, where Dr. Anthony and Nurse Ogawa had been instructed to await their arrival. Leaving Riker in charge of securing the scout ship, Picard entered a turbolift, followed by Batonides. She was silent, almost brooding. Bridge, Picard said, wearily. The car began moving smoothly upward. Johnny, what do you intend to do with Grelin after he wakes up? 
I want to hear his side of the Kairosan conflict, Picard said. From what Riker, Troy, and Corey have already told us, Falhane's indictment against Ruward's government may have real merit after all. Too bad the rebels conveniently relieved Corey of his tricorder before we could examine their alleged evidence, she said acidly. Do you think Grelin's people are fabricating the massacre stories? My first officer and counselor have made a pretty good case that they're not. She sighed and seemed to let down her guard. Since Aubin's death, I'm really not sure what to believe. But you don't trust Grelin. In my field, trust has to be earned. And I have trouble trusting people who've just tried to kill me. Picard nodded. I understand that. And I also understand that they're desperate people. No doubt. But it still strikes me as strange that Grelin confiscated the evidence that might have convinced us that he's in the right and Ruward's in the wrong. Picard felt the car change direction. Now it was moving horizontally toward the center of the ship. It's like you said, Marta. Trust has to be earned, and we have yet to earn Grelin's. He sees us as in league with his sworn enemies. And from his own people's point of view, we've just taken him hostage. Then we've got to send him back to Kiaro's for as soon as possible, she said. The turbolift shifted again, resuming its upward motion. The longer he's with us, the more tensions will escalate on Kiaro's four. And going down there again to gather new evidence to prove who's in the right and who's in the wrong is just going to make us targets for both sides. True, Picard thought. Up to now, every one of our encounters with Kairosans has led to violence. He looked her in the eye. Believe me, I am excruciatingly aware of that. He hadn't been enthusiastic about Grelin's capture in the first place, though he had understood the necessity of it after Will and Badenides had explained it during the flight back to the Enterprise. Then you agree we've got to send him home, she said. Of course. Once Dr. Crusher has certified him fit to travel. And after I speak with him. And Corey. The doors opened, and Picard and Badenides stepped together onto the bridge. Data rose from the command chair, an urgent expression on his pallid face. Captain, we have just detected an extremely unusual energy reading, centered on Kiaro's four's nightside. What sort of reading, Picard said. It is difficult to be certain, given the atmospheric turbulence and magnetic field-driven planetary radiation belts. But it appears that several Starfleet quantum torpedoes have just been detonated on the planet's surface. Picard was taken aback. That's impossible. We're receiving a hail, sir, Lieutenant Daniels said from one of the communications consoles. It's coming from the communications tether orbiting Kiaro's 4. It's first protector Roward. On screen, Lieutenant, Picard said coolly, standing very straight in the center of the bridge. The Kairosan leader sat behind an impressive desk that appeared to have been carved from a single block of wood. An unabashed display of opulence, Picard thought, on a world with an ostensible lack of forested regions. Beside Ruward stood Senator Curins, elbows bent backward and hands behind her back. Both women wore solemn expressions. Ruward spoke first. Captain, I have just been told of the explosion on Nightside. As have I, Madam Protector, Picard said. There are many on my world who would like to thank you, for at last locating and destroying the Army of Light's principal military facility. Unfortunately, in the minds of many this development will also cast additional doubt upon the Federation's motives. You see, our traditionalists prefer field of honor combat to guerrilla warfare. Picard shook his head. Madam Protector, let me assure you that the Federation had nothing whatsoever to do with that. Please do not misunderstand me, Captain, Roward said, holding up one exquisitely articulated hand. I applaud what has happened. Whoever is responsible, the Army of Light now lacks the limbs to hold its blades. If you are responsible, then you have earned my thanks. Madam Protector, the Federation does not try to curry favor with planetary governments by taking sides in internal disputes, Picard said emphatically, his tone deliberate and measured. Nor do we engage in sneak attacks. 
Kieran's displayed several rows of sharp, gleaming teeth. Then we have an inconsistency. Ambassador T. Alec has informed me that the explosives used appear to be of Federation origin. Appear, is the operative word, Senator, Picard said. It would not be the first time the Romulans have attempted to misdirect the blame for their own actions. Roward looked puzzled. Blame? Why would they not wish to take the credit for themselves? You said yourself that the attack on Grelin's base may actually compound the electorate's growing anti-Federation sentiment, Picard replied. If your traditionalists were to see the hand of the Romulans in this, then the referendum might turn out very differently. I think you may have answered your own question, Madam Protector. Curance glared at him. Perhaps, she said, then paused. Speaking of Falhain's rebel successor, we have also been informed that he is now aboard your vessel. Information which also no doubt came from T. Alec, Picard thought. He was convinced that the Romulan ambassador knew far more about her own government's covert activities on Kiaro's fort than she was willing to admit. Picard decided there was nothing to be gained by dissembling about the Kairosan leader. Grelin was seriously injured shortly before his base was destroyed, he said. He's presently in our sickbay. I trust that his wounds were not mortal, Curran said, her voice flat. No, Senator. In fact, Dr. Crusher expects him to make a full recovery. Ruward looked disappointed to hear that. Captain, you will turn him over to my military guard, she said in a low growl. I understand, Madam Protector. But first, I would like to know what will become of him. Ruward's eyes narrowed dangerously. He will be dealt with as an enemy of the state according to Kairosan law. She didn't need to tell them that meant a death sentence. My government tried once already to reach out to Falhain and Grelin in friendship. You witnessed the results yourself. Picard had been afraid she might say something like this, but he wasn't surprised. I'm very sorry to hear that, Madam Protector, he said. Curance tipped her head with evident curiosity. Are you refusing our lawful request, Captain? Surely, that would not be consistent with the vaunted neutrality of your Federation. Let me assure you both, I have no intention of flouting your laws. However, my chief medical officer has yet to certify Grelin as ready to travel. Ruard nodded, a disconcerting smile on her face. Your physician is wise, Captain. No one should be consigned to the flames while infirm. Death must be faced with strength. But please make no mistake, Captain, Curran said. The vote will go badly for you. And if you try to take Grelin with you when you withdraw from our world, a great deal more will go badly for you. At a gesture from Roward, the two Kairosans vanished from the screen. An orbital vista of their storm-tossed homeworld, replaced their images. Batonides broke the silence that had fallen over the bridge. You know I can't let you keep Grelin aboard the Enterprise in defiance of the Kairosan government. The referendum is still two days away, Admiral. I have at least that long before it comes to that. But in the meantime, I can't simply hand him over to someone who feels entitled to summarily execute him. And what about after the referendum? If the Kairosans throw us out, you won't have the legal authority to make that decision. Picard was bitterly aware of that fact, but it changed nothing in his mind. You have the con, Mr. Data, he said, and then stalked back into the turbolift, Batonides following close behind. Standing beside Grelin's biobed, Crusher was methodically applying a dermal regenerator to wounds on the Kairosan's forearms. The burns began to vanish, almost immediately. Picard glanced at the biobed readouts. To his untrained eye, the Kairosan's vital signs appeared strong. A quartet of alert security personnel stood behind Crusher, watching vigilantly as she worked. Ensign Lynch, the head of the security detail, stared wide-eyed at the Kairosan, obviously impressed. He must mass a quarter of a ton, Lynch said incredulously. What I wouldn't give to see him in action. Batonide scowled. 
Ensign, you'd better pray that you never have to tangle with anything that big or mean, outside of your daydreams. Lynch reddened slightly, as though chastised. But he did not avert his gaze from the slumbering Kairosan. Picard glanced to the other side of the sick bay, where Dr. Anthony, Dr. Gomp, Nurse Ogawa, and a pair of orderlies were tending to the various bumps and bruises suffered by Counselor Troy, Lieutenant Hawk, and several members of the Slayton crew, none of whom appeared to be grievously injured. Liz Curlin, the Slayton xenoanthropologist, still had a livid bruise across her forehead. Chief Engineer Hearn took a tentative step on a newly repaired knee. Picard noticed that Zweller was conspicuously absent, as was Riker. Picard tapped his comm badge. Computer, locate Commander Corton Zweller. Commander Corton Zweller is in the main shuttle bay, the computer responded. During the flight back to the Enterprise, Riker had mentioned Zweller's propensity for cloak and dagger behavior. For a split second, he feared that Corey might be trying to flee the ship. Computer, is anyone with Commander Zweller? Commander Zweller is with Commander Riker and Lieutenant Commander LaForge. Batonides approached Picard and spoke quietly. At least we know he's staying put. I think we ought to go to the shuttle bay and ask him for some details about what he saw down on Kiaros 4. I quite agree, Picard said quietly. Then we can return to the problem of whether we can repatriate a guest whose government wants to murder him. He nodded toward Grelin. Suddenly, the Kairosan began to move, as though roused by the captain's words. His crystalline eyes fluttered open, darted quickly about the room, and locked with Picard's. One of his large, bronzed hands reached upward toward Crusher, who backed away as Lynch and the other security officers drew their phasers. The force field restraints crackled against Grelin's biceps and thighs, forcing him back against the table. He struggled again, this time throwing his body into the force field. Through it all, his gaze never wavered from Picard's. He's going to kill himself if he keeps that up, Crusher said. Moving with a dancer's quickness, she emptied a hypospray into one of the Kairosan's tree-like calves. As he began slipping back into unconsciousness, Grelin whispered three clearly articulated syllables. From the shocked expressions on the other faces in the room, Picard knew instantly that he had heard the Kairosan correctly, and that Batonides and Crusher had as well. No one else spoke for a long moment. Finally, Batonides broke the silence. Well, that certainly complicates things, Jean-Luc. Picard nodded gently. It changes everything. But at least I'm no longer bound by law to hand this man over to his executioners, regardless of how the vote turns out. News travels fast on Kiaros 4, Batonide said. How do you think those people will react and they learn that a Starfleet captain has decided to harbor a known terrorist on the Federation's flagship? Picard's voice, turned to sandpaper. It won't be pretty. But my duty, under both interstellar law and Starfleet regulations, is clear. Grelin will receive Federation protection, pending a full investigation of Falhane's allegations against Ruward's government. Referendum, or no referendum. His options were sharply limited, the moment the rebel leader had uttered a single word, the first he had spoken since coming aboard. Asylum Chapter 11 Picard and Batonides entered the main shuttle bay, which currently held a pair of Type 9 personnel shuttlecraft in the flight deck, though neither was powered up at the moment. No other officers were present on the deck, which was as Picard had expected. At Batonides's request, he had ordered the shuttle bay cleared. Apart from the two shuttles, the cavernous hangar was seemingly empty. Their footfalls reverberated loudly across the deck. The Romulan scout ship was nowhere to be seen, which was also as Picard expected, it was cloaked, also at the Admiral's request. Picard deplored having to take these sorts of precautions, but he understood their occasional necessity. During the trip back to the Enterprise, Batonides had made it clear to Commander Roger that his officers weren't to speak to anyone about the scout ship. Given the fragile complexities of Kairosan geopolitics, 
Picard thought her mandate for discretion was probably the wisest course. And despite his reticence about illegally operating a cloaking device, Picard nevertheless thought it prudent to give the Romulan vessel as low a profile as possible while it was aboard the Enterprise. Picard tapped his comm badge. Number 1, 2 to beam aboard the scout ship. Acknowledged, Captain, came the reply. A moment later, Picard and Battenides stood in the small Romulan engine room, where Data, LaForge, and Zweller labored over a partially disassembled computer core. The three officers noted the presence of Picard and Battenides, but went back to their work after the captain made a subtle, as you were, gesture. Riker, who was standing nearby, approached Picard and Battenides. Progress report, number one, Picard said. First, we've managed to stop the flow of Tetrions from the warp core. Good, Picard said. Those emissions might have defeated the purpose of activating the cloaking device. Batonides looked thoughtful. This ship makes me wonder about something Roward said about the referendum. What do you mean, Picard said. I mean that if the outcome really could hinge on our producing proof that the Romulans are really the ones who are up to no good here. Batonides made a broad gesture, encompassing the entire room, then said, well, what more proof do we need, than this ship? Zweller approached, shaking his head. If we try to use this ship to prove that the Romulans have been backing the rebels, I think it'll strike most Kairosans as a bit too convenient. How so, Batonide said. I took a moment to review the electoral poll data, Zweller said. The Kairosan electorate is a skeptical lot. Most of the voting populace thinks we're so desperate, that we'd say or do just about anything in order to win them over now. I'm inclined to agree, Picard said. Batonides shook her head. Very well. But I think you may be punting too early in the game. Admiral, I think we have to look at the big picture here very carefully, Picard said. We mustn't forget that the election is only a small part of the Romulans' real agenda. I suspect that what they're really after remains hidden elsewhere in the Chiaro system. You mean behind the energy field, Riker said, as LaForge and Data set aside their task and approached. Exactly, number one. We may have to accept that the referendum is already lost. Therefore that ship will provide a tactical advantage rather than a political one. You want to keep it in reserve, LaForge said, smiling. A whole card. That's right, Picard said to the engineer. And I want you and Data to find a way to play that card to our best advantage. We can use this ship to see what the Romulans are up to behind that energy barrier. And perhaps, if necessary, to put a stop to it. Batonides didn't look entirely convinced. If the referendum is already lost, then two days is all we have. That's pretty slim timing. We've done more with a great deal less, Picard said. I must point out, Data said, that if we take the scout ship into the region the Romulans are concealing, we will not have the advantage of surprise. The Romulans are no doubt well aware that we have taken this craft. They are certain to be ready for us. Picard smiled. Well, I didn't say it would be easy, Mr. Data. Consider it a challenge. I do indeed, sir. We'll get right on it, Captain, LaForge said. We can also modify another probe to look inside the energy screen, to get a better handle on what the scout ships got in store for it. Picard nodded his approval. Make it so. Geordi and Data excused themselves and returned to their work. Zweller remained behind, looking intrigued. I'd like to know more about this energy field you keep referring to, Johnny, he said to Picard. Picard studied his old academy friend's eager expression. Ordinarily, his impulse would have been to tell him everything he knew. But during the flight back to the Enterprise, he had seen how Zweller's own colleagues had distrusted him. Riker, Troy, and Dr. Gom had made him aware of their suspicions that Zweller had illegally aided the Kairosan rebels, Gomp had even gone so far as to suggest that Zweller had prearranged their capture by the Army of Light. Batonides was evidently having the same misgivings. You'll be briefed in due course, Commander, she said coolly. 
In the meantime, there are a few questions we need to ask you. Picard couldn't have agreed more. Turning back toward Riker, he said, please ask Counselor Troy to come to my ready room, number one. Immediately. What the hell kind of reunion is this anyway, Johnny, Sweller said, looking surprised. What exactly is going on here? That's something I'd like to know as well. Picard spread his hands across the ready room desk and settled back in his chair. Batonides and Troy sat on the sofa, on the other side of the small room. Both women were looking intently at Sweller, who stood with his arms at his sides, fists clenched. Your shipmates have leveled some very serious charges at you, Corey, Batonide said. Is this an interrogation, Marta? Sweller said angrily. Picard sighed. He would have thought that forty-plus years of starship duty might have mellowed his old friend's youthful hot-headedness. No one is interrogating you, Corey, Batonide said, leaving an unspoken but obvious yet hanging in the air. Nevertheless, Picard said, these charges are serious, and must be answered. And there's also the matter of your DNA having been found on the comm badges we recovered after the fight in Hagrate. The circumstantial evidence would suggest that it was you who removed those comm badges from Commander Riker and Counselor Troy after they were struck unconscious in the melee. I noticed that Kairosan disruptors can lock onto subspace signals, Sweller said, nodding. To Troy, he added, don't bother to thank me for saving your lives. Picard considered that for a moment. If that's so, then you certainly have earned my thanks. But Counselor Troy and Commander Riker have both told me that Grelin granted you privileges that he denied to his other prisoners. So I still must ask you, did you supply arms or assistance to the Army of Light? Zweller pointed at Troy. Why don't you get the answer from your Betazoid? You obviously don't have any faith that I'm going to tell you the truth, or else you wouldn't have sicked a telepath on me. I'm only half Betazoid, Mr. Zweller, Troy said calmly. I can only pick up emotions, not specific thoughts. And what is it you're picking up from me? I sense mainly that you are a master of evasion. As well as a skilled manipulator of people. And of the truth. Come now, counselor, Zweller said, his lips turning upward in an asymmetrical half-smile. In my experience, that description could fit just about any frontline Starfleet officer who's managed to stay alive as long as I have. Present company accepted, of course. Picard bridled at Zweller's verbal jab, but said nothing. There was no point in allowing his old friend to provoke him into losing control of the conversation. Batonides also allowed the comment to pass unanswered. Commander, Troy said, unflappably patient, I've known ever since we were confined together that you've been concealing something significant. All I've ever sensed from you is a superficial emotional veneer, almost as though you were able to consciously block my empathic abilities. Zweller adopted a sincere expression that belied his words. Now that would be a remarkable talent. On the other hand, I may just be an extremely shallow person. Maybe there's nothing underneath that emotional veneer, as you call it. Or perhaps it conceals hidden compartments, Picard thought. Like a smuggler's cargo hold. Turning toward Picard, Troy said, I don't think I'm going to be of any help to you here, Captain. Perhaps it would be better if I started interviewing the other Slayton survivors instead. Very well, Picard said. Make it so. As Troy got up to leave the ready room, Sweller spoke to her back. Good idea, Counselor. I knew you'd get around to helping those traumatized people eventually. Troy paused in the open doorway for a moment as though contemplating a rejoinder. Then, apparently realizing the futility of the gesture, she departed. Picard was alone with his two oldest friends for the first time in more than four decades. It struck him then just how profoundly time could change a man. Yes, this Corey Zweller was still a hothead, as he had been at Starfleet Academy. But the loyal, to hell and back Corden Zweller, the comrade at arms who had fought the Nausicans at Bones Tell so long ago, that Corton Zweller, had never made such blatant stabs at a colleague's emotional buttons. 
Corey, did you give the rebels weapons? Badenite said, beginning to lose her patience. Zweller answered with exasperating serenity. Don't you think Grelin would have shown me a little more gratitude if I had? Not if he thought you were selling him out to Reward, Picard said. Zweller sat down, in one of the seats between the sofa and Picard's desk. Focusing his gaze on the viewport, he said, Grelin suffers from a freedom fighter's paranoia. When he caught me hacking into the rebel base's command systems, he naturally assumed the worst. And why were you doing that, Badenite said. I was a prisoner, just like my crewmates. And a prisoner's first duty is to escape. Badenide studied him with obvious skepticism. Some of your crewmates don't seem to believe that, Corey. Dr. Gomp told me that you'd received special treatment from your jailers all along. Must have been that vaunted, mastery of manipulation, the counselor says I excel in, Sweller said dismissively. Turning toward Picard, he said, come on, Johnny, don't tell me you've never charmed your way into an adversary's good graces before turning the tables on him. Picard felt his own fund of patience beginning to run out. Not by violating my oath as a Starfleet officer. If I did bend a regulation or two, Sweller said, then you can rest assured that I did it in the service of a greater good. You mean the army of light struggle against Reward's government, Badenide said. If you like, replied Zweller quietly, nodding slightly. Badenide scowled. I thought you said Grelin was an adversary. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly what that means, isn't it? Zweller said tartly. You won't find any angels on Kiaros 4, Marta. Everyone's hands get bloody in a civil war. How ironic, Picard thought, that Kairosan blood is grey. He decided to try a placating tone. Corey, please. You have to admit that you aren't being very forthcoming. You still haven't answered our primary question. For the sake of the friendship the three of us shared, I would have hoped that you'd. Zweller interrupted gently. That's exactly why I can't tell you anything more, Johnny. If you keep probing into whatever I might or might not have done down there, you're only going to put yourselves in harm's way. Frankly, I'd prefer it if you didn't do that. Corey, that almost sounds like a threat, Picard said, taken aback. Zweller shook his head, then paused to gather his thoughts. Could I speak absolutely candidly to both of you for a moment, he said finally. That would be a nice change, Badenide said. She was not smiling. All you have is the hearsay of two of your officers and the word of an obstreperous Tellarite doctor against mine. You've got no proof of anything, even with an empath in the room. So if you're not prepared to arrest me and convene a general hearing, I respectfully suggest that you both let this matter lie. Picard watched as Badenide silently fumed. He realized that Zweller had outmaneuvered them. For now. All right, Corey, Picard said at length. I will put this matter aside. But only until Grelin, or some of your colleagues from the Slayton, can shed some more light onto it. Thank you, Zweller said, his emotions inaccessible. You are dismissed, Commander, Badenide said icily. Pain that his old friend would not reach out to him, Picard watched in silence, as Zweller exited the ready room. Feeling weary, Zweller entered the quarters Riker had issued him. Picard's first officer had strongly suggested that he remain there, pending the resolution of the political business on Kiaros 4. Noting that he didn't actually seem to be under arrest, Zweller decided he was too tired to argue the point tonight. He'd take the matter up directly with Johnny in the morning. Ensconced in his quarters, Zweller contacted LaForge to request information about the huge volume of space the Romulans were apparently concealing. Though the engineer had seemed a bit overworked and harried, he had promptly uploaded the relevant observational data into Zweller's computer terminal. Though there was no conclusive information about what the Romulans were doing behind the vast invisibility screen they had constructed out in the Kiaro system's far reaches, they were clearly using it to hide an artificial construct of some sort. Zweller waded through the data late into the ship's night, 
a worm of apprehension turning deep in his gut, as he read. The Slayton's crew had not detected the cloaking field before Zweller and his crewmates had taken the shuttlecraft Archimedes down to Kiaros 4. If they had, Zweller thought as sleep finally began to take him, then Section 31 might never have struck its deal with Koval. Picard was not surprised in the least to learn that Romulan Ambassador Tialik wished to meet with him. What did surprise him was that the Ambassador had waited an entire day to respond to his acquisition of the officially non-existent Romulan scout ship. It was shortly after 0800 when Batonides and Troy entered the ready room, where Picard was already seated behind his desk, sipping a cup of Earl Grey. Lieutenant Daniels signaled from the bridge that the Romulan delegation had been beamed aboard and was on its way. Picard smiled over his teacup at the two women, who seated themselves on the ready room couch. This should be good, Picard said, smiling mischievously for a moment before restoring the impassive demeanor of interstellar diplomacy. Troy and Batonides did likewise. Moments later, a pair of security guards escorted T. Alec and her assistant, Vrilm, into Picard's ready room. Picard noted that Vrilm was the very same Romulan whose life he had saved during the armed contraton in Hagrate. Vrilm nodded curtly to him, but there was no hint of gratitude in his eyes. You're quite welcome, the captain thought wryly. Picard did not rise from his chair, nor did he offer Tialik or Vrilm a place to sit. He knew there was nothing to be gained by making them unnecessarily comfortable. Madam Ambassador, Picard said simply. Captain, the Romulan responded, unsmiling. Allow me to introduce Vice Admiral Batonides, of Starfleet Intelligence. And you have already met my ship's counselor, Commander Troy. Tialik bowed her head in courtly fashion. Admiral. Counselor. Vrilm cast a sour glance at Troy. I wish we had been advised of your intention to bring a Betazoid to this meeting, Captain. Perhaps we would have furnished a telepath of our own. Surely that would be unnecessary, Mr. Vrilm, Picard said, deliberately adopting the smile of a magnanimous host. After all, what do either of us have to hide from each other? Troy's expression told Picard that she could probably spend several hours answering that single question. Batonides, for her part, seemed content to let Picard do all the talking. She sat in silence, watching the Romulans closely. Please allow me to come to the heart of the reason for this visit, T. Alec said. I would appreciate that, Ambassador, Picard said. We only have one day left before the planetary referendum, so time is fleeting. And I suppose you've read the polls. T. Alec almost smiled at that. We are well aware of the referendum's likely outcome. And frankly, I have come to ask you to concede those results sooner rather than later. After all, no purpose can be served by waiting until the bitter end. The writing, as you humans say, is on the wall, Vrilne said. Perhaps you're right, Picard said, smiling. He hoped to throw them off balance. It might do my crew some good to leave this dreary region a day or so early. That would be a great relief, Captain, Troy said, falling in step. Picard smiled at the counselor, while aware that the relief Troy had just registered was not her own, Tialik was evidently both surprised and pleased to hear that the Enterprise might be leaving early. Perhaps she sees that as a sign that we won't embarrass her in front of the Kairosans by unveiling the unauthorized ship we captured. That was the moment when Vrilm floored him. The Tal Shi'ar has informed us that you still have the scout ship you used, to escape from the Army of Light's nightside compound, the Romulan assistant said, in a matter-of-fact tone. Picard did his best to hide his surprise. I'm sure I don't know what you mean. T. Alec did not appear phased in the least by her assistant's revelation. Picard supposed that their presentation had been well rehearsed for maximum emotional impact. No, Captain, the ambassador said with a faint smile. I don't suppose that you do. But I must tell you that I am delighted to hear you say it. I'm sure if we were to discover any unauthorized Romulan vessels on Kiaros 4, Picard deadpanned, it would greatly complicate your mission here. Indeed it would, T. Alec said. Picard put on his most solicitous expression. And it would probably place you, personally, 
in an extremely awkward position. It would force the ambassador to protest the actions of her own government, Captain, Vrilm said haughtily. Tialik began to look ever so slightly uncomfortable. In the event of any such discovery, Captain, I would likely have no choice other than to resign my post. As a fellow diplomat, I'm sure you can understand that I cannot be a party to a treaty violation, either official or otherwise. Picard smiled broadly. Madam Ambassador, as a fellow diplomat, I wouldn't dream of placing you in that position. I'm delighted that we understand each other so well, Captain, T. Alex said, bowing her head fractionally. And with that, the Romulan diplomats said their short but polite farewells, then allowed the security officers to escort them out of the ready room. Well, Troy said. Now we know that they know we have the scout ship. Data was right, Batonite said. Whatever we decide to do with that ship, I suppose we can forget about having the element of surprise. I'd already accepted that as a given, Picard said, frowning. But if there's a way around that problem, Geordi and Data will find it. For some reason, our continued presence is making the Romulans very nervous, Troy ventured. Batonides nodded. It can only have to do with whatever the Romulans are hiding behind their cloaking field. Picard rose from behind his desk and walked over to the viewport. The darkness outside was punctuated by thousands of distant pinpoints of light. For a long moment, he silently contemplated the loss of three wide, nominally empty sectors of space, to the Romulans. He found the notion, unacceptable. He suddenly couldn't stomach the thought of losing anything, to such Machiavellian schemers. I quite agree, Picard said with determination. This has all gone on long enough. One way or another, we're going to find out what's behind that cloak. Chapter 12 His eyes closed tightly, Chief Engineer Geordi LaForge, sagged heavily against the side of the turbolift. Bridge, he heard Data say. Geordi opened his eyes, as the car began moving. The android was staring at him, concern evident in his golden eyes. Eyes as artificial as mine, LaForge thought. It struck him as ironic that he could observe his friend's efforts to become human, only by means of a synthetic sensory apparatus. At first glance, the engineer's ocular implants appeared to be perfectly ordinary, natural human eyes, until a close inspection revealed the intricate filigree of hair-thin circuit patterns etched into their metallic blue irises. Are you all right, Geordi? LaForge smiled weakly. Never better, Data. I have noticed that, among humans, even the closest of friends will, on occasion, deliberately prevaricate to one another, Data said evenly. I believe that your response constitutes what Commander Riker would almost certainly describe as a whopper. LaForge nodded, sighed wearily, and massaged his temples. His head felt as though it were being squeezed in a colossal vice. According to Dr. Crusher, his headaches would cease once his nervous system had had a little more time to adjust to its new sensory inputs. Guilty, as charged, Data, LaForge said. For most of the past two days, he and Data had worked alongside engineers Caven and Walter Zydek, the hulking brothers from Balduck, poring over the countless gigaquads of data contained in the captured Romulan scout ship's computer core, seeking two critical command pathways. The first was the electronic portal into whatever Romulan security systems might lay behind the cloaking field, the second was the precise cloaking harmonic frequency needed to get a ship inside that field undetected. He noticed that Data was still staring at him. Did Dr. Crusher not caution you that sleep deprivation might aggravate the temporary neurological discomfort your new sensory inputs are causing? Geordi nodded. She did, Data. And if she asks me about it, I'll promise to sleep for an entire month. After we finish our job here. As the turbolift sped forward and upward toward the bridge, Geordi considered the ramifications of the problems he and Data had just spent nearly 36 continuous hours trying to solve. Tracking down the correct lines of Romulan code among the quadrillions of irrelevant commands had been no simple undertaking, Data's prodigious computational power notwithstanding. The solution had remained stubbornly elusive for the first day, 
despite the endless specialized recursive search programs he and Data had devised for the purpose. Jordi's first hurdle had been overcoming his astonishment over the tremendous storage capacity of the Romulan scout ship's computer core, and the extraordinarily complex information that filled it to overflowing. Such an elegant, convoluted programming techniques made no sense from an engineering perspective, and he had said as much to Corton Zweller during the commander's brief visit to the shuttle bay. Maybe you should stop thinking like an engineer, Zweller had said, chuckling as though LaForge's comment had been unbelievably naive. Instead, why not try looking at it from the perspective of a Romulan Tal Shiar operative? The very mention of the Tal Shiar made Geordi's skin crawl. He remembered only too vividly how Romulan agents had manipulated him six years before, nearly turning him into an assassin. But Sweller's remark had also given Geordi renewed hope that somewhere in the Romulan vessel's electronic labyrinth lay a definitive, if subtly hidden, solution to his problem. And sure enough, a few hours after he had put aside his engineer's tendency to seek out the shortest, simplest solutions, the relevant pieces of code had revealed themselves. Geordi didn't notice that the turbo lift had halted until its doors opened, interrupting his reverie. He and Data strode out onto the bridge, where the members of Alpha Watch were at their customary places. Commander Zweller and Admiral Badenides stood in the center of the bridge, their eyes upon the forward viewscreen, which displayed a featureless region of space. Their attentiveness told LaForge that there must be a great deal more on the screen than met the eye. What exactly are we looking at, he asked aloud. The sensors have picked up several small subspace hiccups over the past few hours, Riker said. And every one of these distortions has been localized within that region. Behind the cloaking field, Sweller added. Picard regarded LaForge and Data. Were you able to learn anything new from our first probe scans? No sir, LaForge said. Whatever's at the center of that effect is still invisible. But I believe I can get a second probe across the barrier intact, and bring in some clear images. Make it so, Picard said, nodding. LaForge and Data immediately busied themselves at the engineering consoles. Data loaded the correct cloaking harmonic information into the probe's isolinear memory buffers while Geordi initiated the device's remote launching system. The Admiral shook her head, looking defeated. I've really got to wonder how anything we might discover could possibly affect the Romulan takeover of the Geminus Gulf this late in the game. We should have an answer for you momentarily, Admiral, Data said. The probe is away. Let's just hope that the Romulans haven't changed their cloaking field frequencies, Sweller said. LaForge's breath caught in his throat. The notion that all of his hard work might have been for naught was simply too much to contemplate right now. I do not believe that will be a problem, Data told Sweller. The cloaked area is no doubt maintained by thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of field generators. Adjusting the harmonics of the entire field would require making very precise changes to each component with utterly perfect synchronization. It is highly unlikely that the Romulans could accomplish this without momentarily lowering the cloaking field. So far, we have seen no evidence of this. LaForge started breathing again. Thank you, Data. I needed that. Everyone's eyes were riveted to the screen's tactical display as the probe rapidly approached the cloaking field's invisible perimeter. And then vanished into its imperceptible interior. LaForge felt moistness on the back of his neck. Had this probe been silenced as easily as the last one? The moment of truth had arrived at last. Any probe signals, Data, he said. Negative, the android replied. Damn. The harmonics must have been wrong after all. Correction, said Data. I am now receiving narrowband subspace telemetry. I do not believe the Romulans will be able to intercept it. The engineer grinned broadly. Bingo. Put it on the screen, Picard said. Lieutenant Hawk's fingers flew across his console in response. The image on the viewer abruptly changed and LaForge heard sharp intakes of breath coming from points all over the bridge. A small, six-sided metallic shape, with a hole through its center, hung in the void, 
occupying the precise center of a spherically arranged network, of even smaller orbiting platforms. Surrounding this was a second, and far larger, conglomeration of tiny pods of gleaming metal, an outer sphere composed of thousands of individual components, each separated from the next by several kilometers of empty space. Jordi had no doubt that this outermost layer made up the network of cloaking field generators, which had kept this gigantic assemblage hidden until now. I want a better look at the object at the center, Picard said. Maximum magnification, Mr. Hawk. The view changed again, and the artifact in question resolved itself into a complicated aggregation of asymmetrical spaceborne structures, clumped together in apparently slapdash fashion into an irregularly hexagonal torus. Jordi and Data exchanged surprised looks after seeing what lay at the object's open center. It raged at them from within an annular metal structure, which could not have measured more than a kilometer or two in diameter. There, in an extremely compact volume, blazed a primordial inferno, a barely constrained fury, so intense that it might have been the cosmic forge in which the universe itself had been made. Mon Dieu, La Forge heard the captain say, apparently to no one in particular. La Forge, Data, and stellar cartography specialist Renaud Carew, stood on the raised central dais of the cavernous, three-story stellar cartography room. Captain Picard, and all of the senior officers stood beside the dais, along with Batonides, Sweller, Commander Roger, and Lieutenant Hawk. Picard gazed briefly at each of the three officers on the dais. What definitive information can you tell us about the phenomenon out there? The captain's voice echoed slightly in the oversized dome chamber. Based on our probe sensor telemetry, the engineer said, the object at the center of those cloaked structures is a subspace singularity. The first one, in fact, ever discovered, Karu said. Batonides's eyebrows rose inquisitively. Would you explain that a bit for the benefit of those of us who aren't physicists or engineers, Commander? It'll be easier if we show you, Admiral, Karu said as he touched a control surface atop the dais-wide, swooping handrail. Everyone looked upward as an enormous holographic representation of the turbulent singularity, the roiling fireball at the center of the hexagonal Romulan array, suddenly appeared in mid-air, filling half of the map room's arch ceiling display space. As LaForge studied the spectacular image, he felt his fatigue draining away. Pure, adrenaline-fueled wonder, took its place. What you are seeing, Data said, is the singularity's event horizon, the boundary past which all infalling matter or energy, in this case, the solar wind from the Kairosan star, becomes crushed to infinite density at the object center. That region is invisible, since even light cannot escape it. The turbulent band of exterior material which you can see is located on the event horizon's periphery, where the object's powerful gravitational field is accelerating it into various forms of lethal hard radiation, such as delta particles and Berthold rays. LaForge saw Hawk and Karu exchange a worried glance. How can a network of cloaking devices contain radiation as powerful as that, Hawk said. Karu shrugged, prompting LaForge to respond to Hawk's question. It can't. The innermost sections of the Romulan facility seem to be doing that. The cloaking network's function is to keep the whole thing invisible and subspace silent, along with a large volume of the surrounding space. In fact, Data said, the entire apparatus may have been here for decades. Sensor telemetry shows that it orbits the Kairosan star at a mean distance of about 800 million kilometers, about 650 million kilometers farther out, on average, than the orbit of Kiaros 4. Given the turbulent atmosphere on that planet, it is unlikely that the Kairosans ever would have discovered it on their own. Strange, Batonide said blandly. It looks like the event horizon of a typical, garden-variety black hole to me. Albeit a bit more spectacular. It's very similar, Admiral, but there's one critical difference, LaForge said. The object's singularity, that is, its point of infinite compression, lies in subspace instead of in normal space. For the moment, that's where most of its effects are confined. 
However, data added, local spacetime curvature measurements show that the object's tremendous gravitational field has been steadily weakening the boundary between normal space and subspace, perhaps for billions of years. And now it finally has the potential to have serious effects on normal space, Carew added. Zweller shook his head in apparent disbelief. If this object has such a strong gravitational field, then why hasn't it affected the orbits of the planets in this system? Good point, said the engineer. My guess is that the object's gravitational influence is also largely confined to subspace. Along with most of its radiation output. That still doesn't explain why no Federation ship ever detected it earlier, said Crusher. Say, from its subspace radio noise. The Singularity subspace emissions occur at much higher frequencies than those most star-faring cultures use for communications, Data explained. Other normal space phenomena, such as Chiaro's Fors atmosphere and magnetosphere, generate far more noticeable interference in the communications bands. The Romulans obviously stumbled upon the phenomenon first, Picard said. We've just come in a distant second. Or maybe third, Sweller said quietly. The Slayton got here before the Enterprise did. To LaForge's broadband visual receptors, the man looked ashen, as though something had just gone radically awry with his cardiovascular system. But other than Counselor Troy, who was also gifted with unusual perceptions, no one else seemed to notice Sweller's apparent change of mood. Nevertheless, all eyes were now on Sweller, who had lapsed into silence. It was Commander Roger who finally spoke up. A couple of months before the Slayton entered the Geminis Gulf, the Argus Array picked up some unusual subspace distortion waves centered on this system. They were far too infrequent and intermittent to pin down to an exact epicenter. I am familiar with the Argus information, Data said with enthusiasm. It is possible that the Romulans must periodically release some of their excess subspace energy into normal space, energy that manifests itself as subspace distortions. That might explain those subspace hiccups we've been picking up over the past few hours, Riker said. And why the Romulan ambassador seemed so anxious for us to leave the area, Picard said. Perhaps she knew that her countrymen were likely to spill some of their excess subspace energy today, and didn't want us nearby asking questions about it. Roger shrugged. It's also possible that the Romulans simply can't control the singularity as well as they think they can. There didn't seem to be any regular pattern to the distortions after all. And the Slayton couldn't detect them at all, at least, not before she was destroyed. You think that the Slayton encountered the phenomenon after your shuttlecraft left for Kiaros 4, Troy said. Roger nodded, his expression grim. And I also think that those Romulan bastards destroyed her for getting too close to their secret energy project. LaForge glanced once more at Sweller, noting that he was growing steadily paler in the infrared frequency band. The Romulans would certainly be highly motivated to keep this phenomenon under wraps until they've formally taken control of the Geminis Gulf, Picard said. And that motivation would seem to implicate them in the Slayton's destruction, Data said. They have found what may be the most powerful object ever discovered, as long as they can keep the bulk of the phenomenon's radiation and gravitational effects bottled in subspace, so to speak, they will have access to virtually unlimited quantities of energy. And to think that all these years Starfleet believed that the Geminis Gulf was nothing but an empty desert, Badenite said, evidently to no one. Interestingly, Data said, one of 20th century Earth's most desolate regions also held vast reserves of energy, in the form of petroleum. Wars over this substance were fought in the region known as the Middle East, where... Thank you, Data, Picard interrupted, his brow wrinkled with concern. But our primary concern is how to deal with the subspace singularity. First, I need to know if it poses any immediate danger, either to the Enterprise or to Kiaros 4. Data nodded. That is a distinct possibility, Captain, particularly if the inner containment facility were to suffer a catastrophic failure. The singularity itself appears to generate the very power that the Romulans are using to contain it. However, the malfunction of a critical component of their power grid could allow a great deal of radiation to escape. 
far more than either the Enterprise's shields or the planet's magnetic field could cope with. Or, LaForge added, a containment breach could allow a lot of gravitational energy to escape into normal space. A large enough graviton flux could create havoc in this system. Meaning what, Picard said. Karu coughed quietly before speaking. Meaning that Kiaros 4 could be thrown clear out into interstellar space. Or dropped straight into its sun. Or simply ripped to pieces. How could something that powerful have come into existence in the first place, Troy said. No one knows for certain, Data said as he executed an extraordinarily human-looking shrug. It is possible that only the primordial fireball from which all matter and energy originated could have created such a dense concentration of energy and mass. The Big Bang itself, Picard said, the awe in his voice unrestrained. Crusher fidgeted. This all sounds a little too huge to comprehend. What does all of this mean in practical terms? That's a fair question, Doctor, LaForge said. Theoretically, this subspace singularity has a gravitational potential millions of times more powerful than that of even the most massive black holes. We've known for a long time now that Romulan ships are powered by small artificial singularities. If the Romulans managed to harness this thing, it would yield trillions of times more energy than even their largest singularity-driven warp cores. Batonides whistled quietly, obviously impressed. Picard too, seemed to grasp the implications immediately. Zweller stood in brooding silence, his hands clasped behind his back. With a power source like that at their disposal, Picard said somberly, the Romulans might be able to manage trans-warp drive, like the Borg. Their ships could venture from Romulus to Earth in moments. And that's only the beginning, LaForge said. With that much energy on tap, they could probably build and dismantle stable wormholes at will. They could send their troops anywhere in the galaxy, maybe anywhere in the universe, without even having to bother building ships. They'd make the ancient Iconians look like they were standing still. He paused while everyone in the room silently pondered the implications. Finally, Riker ended the silence. Well, now that we know why the Romulans want this system so badly, the next question is, what to do about it. Agreed, said Picard. Options? The captain looked quickly at each person in the room. Another uncomfortable hush descended. This time it was the Admiral who broke the spell. I'm inclined to agree with Commander Roger's interpretation of this thing, she said, massaging one of her temples. The fact that this singularity is still belching fire and subspace distortions every so often tells us one thing loud and clear, the Romulans don't have complete control over it yet. That may be, Admiral, LaForge said. Commander Data, Commander Karu, and I have been wondering all along if the Romulans haven't bitten off more than they can chew. LaForge nodded to Karu, who activated another control on the railing. Instantly, a multi-layered graph superimposed itself over the image of the subspace phenomenon, highlighting it with a series of colored bands. Data spoke again. The amber-colored areas show the pattern of gravimetric stresses that the singularity is bringing to bear on normal space. These stress patterns seem to indicate that the Romulans are trying to maximize the phenomenon's energy output by keeping it balanced precisely between normal space and subspace. This is where things get very dicey, LaForge said. If they've miscalculated the stress points between normal space and subspace, then the singularity will rip into our universe directly through these stressed regions. It'll be like an iron anvil smashing through a rotting wooden floor. And what happens then, Riker said, his blue eyes wide. LaForge spread his hands and shrugged. Worst case scenario. All of normal space gets sucked into subspace. Or perhaps vice versa, said Data, obviously intrigued with this line of speculation. In fact, it is possible that all of space and subspace would be drawn into the singularity, precipitating a repeat of the Big Bang explosion itself. Such a phenomenon might even subsequently create an entirely new universe. After blowing this one to quarks first, Riker said dryly. The Admiral spoke up, getting everyone's attention. 
Just before the first atomic bombs were tested on Earth back in the 20th century, nobody was sure what the outcome would be. Some physicists worried that they might burn up every last oxygen molecule in the atmosphere in a single colossal, unstoppable firestorm. But they went ahead and detonated the first bomb anyway. The worst didn't happen. Luckily. She looked gravely at every person standing in the cathedral-like room, before continuing. This time, we can't afford to be quite so, callous. Or, allow the Romulans to be. Picard stood by quietly as the singularity's image blazed overhead, eerily quiet. No one spoke for perhaps an entire minute as the captain ruminated, his expression unfathomable as he stared at the representation of the singularity. Finally, he looked away and regarded each and every face in the room once again, settling at last on LaForge and Data, who still stood on the dais beside Keru. If the Romulans were smart enough to beat us to discovering and harnessing this thing, Picard said, then surely they've also anticipated the risks. They must have a plan to abort what they're doing. Some means of jettisoning the singularity permanently into subspace. That would be a rational contingency plan, Captain, Data said. A successful abort however, would involve causing a deliberate and extremely precise collapse of the Romulan's containment force fields, while simultaneously sealing the breach between subspace and normal space. There would be no margin for error. If we could neutralize this new Romulan toy, Batonite said, then losing the Geminus Gulf to them would be an acceptable price to pay. And it would also remove the Romulan's entire reason for coming here in the first place, Riker said, smiling slightly at the irony. Mr. Carew, please deactivate the image, Picard said, signaling that he had come to a decision. Carew touched a button and the singularity abruptly vanished. Once again, the captain spoke toward the dais. Mr. LaForge, Mr. Data, in just under four hours, the Kairosan referendum will officially conclude. I expect that we won't be able to remain in this system for very long after that without seriously provoking the Romulans. LaForge smiled. Data and I already have a plan that we think we can pull off before the electoral deadline. I was hoping you'd say that, Picard said, a slow smile crossing his face. What will you need? The Romulan scout ship, Mr. Data, a good pilot, and a couple of hours of preparation time. That singularity ought to be back where it came from permanently by the time we get booted out of here. Hold it, Batonide said sharply. You can't be planning to fly that scout ship into the lion's den, Mr. LaForge. The lion already has a pretty good idea that we're coming. Fortunately, Data said, the element of surprise will be entirely irrelevant to our plan. We will need only to stay within the cloaking field long enough to establish a link between the Romulan security network and my own neural nets. With a little luck, the scout ship will be halfway back to the Enterprise before the Romulans even know what hit them, LaForge said. Sweller was wearing a sour expression. So that's your solution. Destroy the most potent source of power ever discovered. I'm not thrilled about it, Commander, said the engineer. But it seems like a better idea than giving the Romulans a chance to use it against us. Why are you so sure your plan is going to work, Commander LaForge, Batonite said, sounding skeptical. The engineer placed an arm about Data's shoulders, momentarily surprising him. Because, Admiral, even the smartest Romulan can't think nearly as fast as the Enterprise's second officer. Data looked embarrassed. Why, thank you, Geordi. Picard smiled. Then make it so, Mr. LaForge, Mr. Data. Mr. Hawk, I'd like to have you aboard that scout ship as well. LaForge noticed a slight scowl forming on Kara's face, though the stellar cartographer said nothing. Hawk beamed, apparently not noticing Kara's reaction. Captain, I'd be happy to volunteer. I'm looking forward to having a go at that scout ship's cockpit. Picard dismissed his officers, and LaForge and Data were the first to leave the room, nearly at a run. With yet another inscrutable riddle before him, the engineer felt fairly abuzz with excitement. Sleep is overrated anyway, he thought, his agile mind already setting up several new equations as he entered the turbolift alongside his android friend. 
The knowledge that the Romulans were now poised to take over, or perhaps even annihilate, the universe settled uneasily in Corton Zweller's gut. Compared to the singularity, Koval's list of Romulan spies now seemed impossibly trivial. Zweller now had to accept the bitter truth that he, and Section 31, had been duped. Taken in by a master deceiver, to be sure. But fooled nonetheless. He mulled these self-recriminations over as he watched Lieutenant Hawk and most of the other officers file out of stellar cartography. He wondered if Hawk had said anything to Picard or Batonides about their conversation on the scout ship, and which way Hawk's loyalties would ultimately lead him. Suddenly, Zweller noticed Counselor Troy's appraising stare. Hurriedly, he reinforced his mental shields. Had he allowed his regrets to compromise him? Troy spoke briefly, too softly for Zweller to overhear, to both Picard and Batonides. A moment later, the captain approached Zweller, regarding him with a taut expression. Please wait for us in the aft observation lounge, Commander. I think there's still some unfinished business left over from our previous conversation. Zweller's pulse thundered in his ears as he left the chamber, alone. He knew he had to be the principal topic of whatever conversation was now occurring in the room behind him. He closed his eyes for a moment, and the flames of the singularity blazed behind his eyelids. What a waste, he thought, to banish such a useful thing forever, into subspace. There has to be a better alternative. He decided to speak to Lieutenant Hawk about that, at the earliest opportunity. End of Part 6 This book will be released in segments each week on our YouTube channel, free of charge. However, to help support the costs involved in creating this audiobook, the entire book is available now to our Patreon supporters. If you would like to listen to the entire book early, please visit patreon.com slash yjk audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and may you live long and prosper.